Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. My name is Archie Kaiser. I'm a professor here, cross-appointed to the Department of Psychiatry. This event is part of our mini law school series of public talks. We invite people into the Weldon Building, and we ask our faculty to share their perspectives on contemporary legal and policy issues. At the outset, Dalhousie wants to remind us all that this university is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. Tonight uh, is a special evening uh, for our mini law series. Um, I will be providing a broad overview of some critical developments as we slowly wind down the war on drugs and uh, look towards the future and what that might entail. But it is especially noteworthy for me and for the law school because of the participation of our guest panelists who will no doubt provide you with deeper insights than I will. I'll speak for about a half hour. They'll speak for about a half hour in total, um, and then uh, we'll have the opportunity for questions. I want to introduce our panel uh, briefly. Um, on my immediate right is Cindy McIsaac, and I asked each of them, by the way, what uh, they were comfortable with my saying, so I didn't pull it out of thin air, uh, and uh, all of this is with their approval. Uh, so Cindy has been executive director since 2001 of Direction 180. Uh, it's a community-based methadone clinic, uh, a program of the Mi'kmaq Friendship Center. It employs a low threshold concept as part of a harm reduction model. Cindy has more than 40 years of personal experience with substance use and recovery and has been a tireless advocate for improving access to services and supports for people who use substances to reduce the risks of, and these are her words, but I share them entirely, of draconian drug policies. Next, uh, we have Jillian Mitz, um, and uh, Jillian uh, is, is a person who is thoroughly dedicated to a harm reduction approach. She's a member of Hand Up, uh, that is the Halifax Area Network of Drug Using People. This is a nonprofit that tries to improve the lives of people who use drugs uh, through use peer-based uh, support and evidence-based uh, education. Uh, she's also a member of PALS, uh, which helps to, uh, don't ask me all the acronyms here, uh, which helps uh, prisoners transition to the community, uh, including people who use drugs. Uh, she works with Mainline, uh, which is a harm reduction facility associated uh, uh, with Direction 180. Uh, they provide harm reduction through supplies and uh, uh, needle uh, exchanges. Um, and uh, uh, Jillian also supports sex workers and their human rights and the harm reduction model there. She's a member of Stepping Stone. Jillian said that she has many years of lived experience. She truly believes in harm reduction and helping to keep people in the community safe. She says she's excited to give back to the community after she feels that she did damage. Um, she says she's lived on all sides of the tracks. Um, so that's uh, uh, Jillian. And on my far right, we have uh, Doug Earl. I tried to take his hat so I could cover my bald head, uh, but he is clinging to it. Uh, Doug is proud now to have been sober for three years, uh, and a bit, I think, Doug, isn't it? Yes. Um, Doug says that he has been in and out of group homes and the criminal justice system, and these are his words, he did a lot of damage to his life. Uh, he just told me that was his reality. Now he's part of the solution, as he says, he's a member of Hand Up uh, as well, and PALS, and so he too uh, is a person both with lived experience, uh, but also the dedication to uh, pursue the kind of harm reduction options that I'll be talking about tonight. So uh, I want to say thank you to all of them. And uh, last, but by no means least, although she's not here, uh, you can tell her I said so, I want to thank Elizabeth Sanford from the Law School Administration for her usual organizational prowess. I want to thank uh, Eastlink Community TV um, and uh, its videographer Noah Rideout uh, for helping to make this evening more readily available on uh, uh, Eastlink Cable, in particular their Podium TV. And finally, I want to, to uh, acknowledge and thank 
our Dalhousie YouTube videographer, Bruce Bottomley, uh, there at the rear. So thank you to all of you in the audience for coming. Thank you to our panelists, and thank you to those who have contributed. I feel slightly humbled now because some of my former and, cor former and current students are here, and uh, I'm sure they'll be thinking next time they come to class, it was so much better with those guests. Uh, but that said, what you're going to get tonight is, uh, you know, what is in some ways a garden variety presentation by a law professor um, where I try to organize the grand themes um, and gradually distill it into different topics that I hope will be digestible for you and I'm to time myself as well. So um, you know, the overview is relatively simple. We're going to start looking at the uh, war on drugs uh, and acknowledge this terrible you know, public policy failure. Um, I see the legalization of cannabis as a partial retreat, uh, but in my view, other mindless hostilities also need to cease. I see human rights um, as uh, driving harm reduction uh, and the proper approach to problematic substance use. I'll be talking about the more recent evolution in Canada of our new uh, and evolving drugs and substances strategy, which foregrounds harm reduction. I'll talk about how our courts have recognized the needs of harm <coughs> reduction measures. I'll talk about Canada's progress uh, towards human rights in this field and how it cannot be taken for granted um, because of the ups and downs of government and public policy. I will talk as well because I've been associated uh, uh, with uh, the people on the panel and others uh, about local harm reduction efforts and I'll refer to some uh, uh, of the uh, local proposals specifically for an overdose prevention sites. I'll extend my analysis to think about uh, the decriminalization of other substances as another public health and human rights promoting measures. And finally, because I'm the typical overambitious prof, I want to extend the analysis even beyond that because I do think that the same health and human rights approaches can be used elsewhere uh, in other justice spheres. And so I decided to take on firearm-related homicide as well. So that's what I'm going to cover. Um, we have gone in some strange directions uh, in the last approximately 100 years. We went from the popular use of a whole range of drugs, uh, such as cocaine toothache drops, and it probably did, and I see some doctors in the audience, probably did provide an instantaneous cure uh, for uh, uh, toothaches, but they were widely available. They were medicines, they were consumed uh, uh, recreationally, they were part of commerce, um, uh, but we decided to take a different direction, approximately approximately 1910 to 1920 in Canada. Um, these are American examples, but you, you get the feeling. Uh, some of you are as old as I am and can remember uh, that uh, no less than Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon, I didn't call him anything else, Richard Nixon you know, said that you know, public enemy number one in the United States was drug abuse. And then Nancy Reagan came on you know, with, uh, I think this would work, you know, it, Probably, if we lived on another planet, but Nancy said, just say no. That was her prescription you know, for dealing with drugs. But what happened was uh, that uh, these kinds of notions fueled uh, a militaristic uh, and prohibitionist and eliminationist uh, approach uh, uh, to uh, problematic substance use. And you know, the consensus um, is uh, uniform that, and I've given you several sources here, that the war on drugs pro was proven to be ineffective. It resulted in much health-related harm. That uh, this was not a battle that could ever be won. Uh, that we over-relied on the criminal law. We did more harm than good. Uh, and, uh, you know, as has been said before, we should be joining forces around the world uh, for change. Uh, Canada should be finding humane and effective ways to reduce the harm caused by drugs to people and society. What was one of the problems? It's only one of the problems of uh, the of war on drugs. Well, it failed to acknowledge uh, the realities of drug use. Uh, people uh, were going to continue using substances irrespective of the criminal law. 
Uh, drug dependence, uh, we now recognize as distinct from drug use, is a medical condition requiring appropriate evidence-based treatment, not criminal sanctions. Uh, that punitive drug control regimes increase the harms associated with drug use. And I give you the citation here, and I'll be talking extensively, I'm making reference to the United Nations General Assembly report of the Special Rapporteur that specifically dealt you know, with uh, a different and a modern approach uh, to uh, controlling and trying to respond to the needs of people with drug use issues. Why were we attracted to the war uh, response? Um, well, he, he, uh, this is from uh, uh, you know, Chris Hedges, you know, where he talks about war relegating nuanced solutions to dark psychic uh, recesses. And we end up with, unfortunately, bad answers to problems that are otherwise remediable. Uh, Chris talks about, in his book, war making the world, sadly, understandable. Uh, and that the moral certitude of the state in wartime is a kind of fundamentalism. It gives us a grasp on reality that unfortunately is entirely misleading. As Lawrence Lachan has talked about it, uh, we end up embracing the mythic reality of war, where words can no longer be relied on and no real communication is possible. Um, we contrast, I hope, and I, I think we may be seeing the beginning of this, uh, we contrast the more desirable sensory reality of peacetime, uh, where in peacetime at least, and maybe we're going to start to do this, we re-examine the war mentality. And uh, we sometimes, and I hope we will see soon on a more universal basis, we sometimes look at our wartime attitudes and see them as illegitimate and simply stupid. And we see events more for what they are. That, I hope, is part of the recovery from the war on drugs mentality. It's a pretty useful depiction of, uh, of the uh, misuse of the criminal justice system to control, actually this is now legal uh, in, in Canada, um, you know, and that is, a, 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 I think, useful to think about uh, the misuse of the criminal law. Well, as I mentioned in the title of my talk, uh, that I, th I think the legalization of cannabis in Canada is a, indeed a partial retreat. I, I'm not saying that uh, we have peace yet, but it's a partial retreat. Uh, look at the progress of the legalization of cannabis in Canada. We went from a statement of government in intentions to a task force uh, that uh, eventually resulted in a bill. That all happened in about uh, 12 months. From April in 2016, then, the government announced its attention to legalize and regulate access uh, to cannabis. June 2016, the <coughs> task force uh, you know, canvassed uh, public opinion and expert opinion across Canada. And in the task force report, they said, our recommendations reflect a public health approach to reduce harm and promote health. The task, put, task force input then you know, emphasized principles and values that I think are better guides than uh, the prohibitionist response. The task force talked about protection of public health and safety, minimizing harms, maximizing benefits, compassion for vulnerable members of society, and fairness in avoiding disproportionate and unjustified burdens to particular groups. The uh, Cannabis Act, and I'm not going to talk extensively about the Cannabis, the Cannabis Act, indeed I'm talking about the aftermath of it, but even in its statement of purposes in Section 7, the statute talks <coughs> about the need to protect the health of young persons, enable licit uh, and deter illicit activities, reduce the burden on the criminal justice system, provide access to uh, quality controlled supplies, and enhance public awareness of health risks. Those same statutory purposes might also be useful, as I'll move on uh, shortly, to thinking about decriminalization, and then possibly also in other domains as well. In Canada, you should all be aware that right now we have an evolving uh, drugs and substances strategy. Consultations are being conducted, um, and the government of Canada has made a commitment to a public health approach comprehensively to dealing with substances. They say it's going to be comprehensive, collaborative, and compassionate. They say that they're going to restore harm reduction as a core pillar of Canada's approach to substances beyond uh, cannabis. Uh, they are going to address a broad range of legal and now illegal substances. They're going to focus on innovative approaches, evidence-based policies and progress, 
uh, and reducing stigma. That's what they say they're going to do in the CDSS. Uh, with respect to harm reduction, the CDSS uh, recognizes the importance of streamlining processes for supervised consumption sites, of which more a bit later. Class exemptions uh, for overdose prevention sites, of which again we'll be talking, and a clear focus on reducing drug-related stigma. So its, its heart and its head is in the right place if we're really going to follow it as a nation. Its pillars of prevention, treatment, um, and harm reduction and, and uh, enforcement all make sense as part of an approach which emphasizes a strong evidence base, where we're now, we say, turning towards evidence and away from ideology, which is what has driven the war on drugs. Uh, so the CDSS, and I excerpt from it here, says that it's going to address root causes of problematic substance use, reducing stigma, using innovative approaches, employing a health lens to regulation and appropriate enforcement, supporting indigenous peoples, addressing the needs of at-risk populations, and grounding substance use policy in evidence, again, in facts, not ideology. So why is there this shift represented by the UN uh, General Assembly Rapporteur, by our new uh, uh, legalization efforts with respect to cannabis, um, and with respect to the Canadian evolving drugs uh, uh, strategy. Uh, well, I want to think about uh, this from a human rights promoting perspective. The special rapporteur from the UN says, a human rights approach to drug control must be adopted as a matter of priority to move towards the creation of a humane system that meets its own health-related objectives. Public health measures, generally referred to as harm reduction, must be adopted, the rapporteur said, instead of the war on, on drugs. We should be decreasing the negative consequences of substance use, reducing the health and social problems associated with its use among families and societies. So we think then about harm reduction. What are we talking about? Well, it, it's an easy concept, uh, at least to consider, and it makes such perfect sense to me. It refers to policies, programs, and practices that are aimed at reducing drug-related risks and harms by advancing the health and human rights of people who use drugs. Harm reduction interventions aim to reduce the harms associated with the use of psychoactive drugs without necessarily discouraging use because it's going to happen in any event. So there are many examples of harm reduction uh, interventions uh, that countries ha have uh, considered. Needle and syringe programs, which we now have. Substitute medication prescribing, which we have. Overdose prevention, which we are going to be talking about. Drug consumption rooms or sites. Root transition interventions. Outreach and peer education. Um, access to justice. Access to appropriate medical services. Uh, at least pondering decriminalization and protection against abuses by police and health care providers for people who use drugs and support for political participation. So when we think of people who use drugs and we think of the appropriateness, indeed in my view, the necessity of harm reduction approaches, we really should be thinking about it from an international human rights law perspective. That speaks powerfully to me and to the United Nations and to many countries that are uh, focusing on harm reduction as a central pillar. They say it's based in international human rights law. So it's a matter of right, not just evidence, not just good sense, a matter of fundamental human rights. When we don't protect people's human rights, which is the way we have treated drug users in this country for the last 100 years, what inevitably has occurred in Canada and elsewhere? Well, first of all, when we don't protect people's human rights, we create risky environments for people who use drugs. Um, we, uh, when we have a lack of human rights protection, it prevents people from, uh, who use drugs from accessing services and treatment. When we don't foreground human rights, we know that this disproportionately impacts members of vulnerable and marginalized communities, people who are already on the edge. And we also know that we fail, when we fail to foreground human rights protections, people who use drugs are often subjected to discrimination uh, in medical settings as well. These two cartoons, you know, help a, a little bit, making the point graphically. Uh, if you're poor and get caught with drugs, it's a crime. If you're rich, a celebrity, you get caught with drugs, it's a scandal, and you go to rehab. 
and you have a press conference, and you say how sorry you are. Uh, but we also know there has been, you know, at its inception, the war on drugs was discriminatory, you know, spawned uh, by racial myths and disgusting discriminatory attitudes, but it's continued that way in our country and others. Um, you know, these are American sources, but the point they make in most nations is apt, um, that the message of the war has been uh, black and white, uh, and uh, you know, as these protesters say, you know, a, a war on us. But that goes through other uh, marginalized, racialized communities as well. So, when we think about persons who use drugs and their fundamental human rights, um, let's delve a little bit more deeply into that. I first want to talk about uh, the importance of health as a human right. I think we have that broad notion in, in Canada, but it's well grounded in international human rights law. Uh, indeed, as the UN says, health is a human right that's indispensable for the exercise of other human rights. Under international human rights law, everyone has the right to enjoy the enjoyment of the highest attain attainable standard of, of physical and mental health. Um, and the enjoyment of the right to health of, of all people who use drugs is applicable irrespective of the fact of their drug use. They're still humans when they use drugs. So, you know, if you're one of my students, you'd be anxiously copying down these uh, international human rights conventions, but I'll just mention them for you now because this shows that the world community through the United Nations and through treaties that Canada and other nations have signed really does accept the fundamental right to health and the highest attainable standard of health. So the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights says everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for his or her uh, health and well-being, including food, clothing, housing, and medical and necessary uh, social services. The International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural, Cultural Rights says that the, the, it is the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, including steps for the prevention, treatment, and control of diseases and other public health pro uh, problems. The Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women repeats the notion here quite appropriately that there's been discrimination against women in the field of health care services, and we need to address that as an international human right. Um, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial discrimina Discrimination talks about the same rights uh, without distinction as to race, color, national or ethnic origin, including the right to public health and so on. The Convention on the Rights of the Child, and we understand that many drug users are uh, indeed children or near children, uh, recites the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which includes people with physical and mental and other disabilities, uh, talks about, uh, again, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health without discrimination on the grounds of, of disability. Uh, and it also includes the prevention of the discriminatory denial of health care or health care services on the basis of disability. And we can think of people who use drugs when they're used problematically as being persons who themselves may have a disability as a result. So that's international human rights law. Um, I want to talk as well about uh, the reception of our courts to the notion of harm reduction. I teach criminal law and procedure. Some of my students will no doubt groan at this, but I teach, for example, at the coal face of the war on drugs. You know, how do you get a wiretap, you know, to uh, uh, interrupt the conspiracy to, to traffic? You know, how do you search the individual when they're detained at a highway check and so on? Our courts became immersed in the war on drugs. But on the other hand, although they adopted that mentality, in some ways to my regret as somebody who reveres uh, our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. On the other hand, our courts also stood up at times. And I refer specifically to the Canada versus PHS case in 2011, where our Supreme Court uh, took a, a unanimous stand against the then government uh, that was uh, going to deny the renewal of an exemption for insight. You know, that, was a, 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 that is a program in Vancouver uh, that provides a whole range of, of uh, supports for people who use uh, uh, drugs. 
they denied a renewal of the, the, the permit, uh, which entitled uh, Insight to be exempt uh, from uh, the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. So it would have meant the effective closure of it. The Supreme Court of Canada said, no, you are not going to do that. And look at some of these quotes from the Supreme Court. They talk about supervised injection sites being used with success to address, to address health issues associated with injection drug use in other parts of the world. They talk about health authorities increasingly recognize that health care for injection drug users cannot amount to a stark choice between between abstinence, just say no, and foregoing health services. Our Supreme Court said that traditional criminal law prohibitions have done little to reduce drug use, uh, that risk to injection drug users of death and disease is reduced with harm reduction measures, uh, and that insight particularly did not contribute to increased crime rates or increased in incidence of public injection or relapse rates. In Vancouver, it was and is perceived favorably or neutrally by the public, and it furthers the objectives of public health and safety. Prohibiting insight, which the then government, the then government was prepared to do, was grossly disproportionate to its effects, contrary to the principles of fundamental justice under our charter. Insight saved lives. Uh, its benefits were proven. There was no discernible negative impact on public safety and health objectives. And the effect of denying the service of insight, which is what the, the failure to provide a renewal of its permit would have involved, uh, was grossly disproportionate. Uh, to uh, any benefit that Canada might uh, derive from pre presenting a uniform stance on the possession of narcotics. They said there should be exceptions because those exceptions worked and insight worked. Now, the then government, um, and it was the Harper government, um, you know, and I'll show you specifically that they own it, uh, the then government's reaction to uh, the Insight case from the Supreme Court of Canada, and normally, let's be absolutely clear of this, under a democratic system ruled by law, when the Supreme Court of Canada says you do something and this is the law, you do it no matter who you are, right? That's the whole point of the rule of law. The then government introduced almost immediately the Respect for Communities Act. And as the Huffington Post author said, how do you defy the highest court in the land? You replace the law that spawned the Insight case, and it, they, according to the author, it shouted, in your face, Supreme Court, you try to turn the court's decision on its head because you reject it. The Canadian Nurses Association in 2015 said uh, that this approach imposed unnecessary and excessive barriers. It was founded on ideology rather than evidence, and the Canadian nurses were not fooled by that. So Bill C-65-C-2 was, uh, uh, and this is from the government's uh, promotion. This is, I didn't make this up. This is what they said. Uh, they talked about ins the insight law, as they called it, having the potential for great harm in a community. Um, and they said, our new act is, will, will raise the bar for applications, and an exemption such as insight head would only be granted in truly exceptional circumstances. Now, I don't know what that would be, because insight head... Uh, amply proved its exceptional circumstances for the Supreme Court of Canada. And this is their own news release. We are demonstrating how the Harper government is acting to promote public health and public safety. That's the part that I mentioned from the Huffington Post where the author said, this is in your face, Supreme Court. Because the Supreme Court said, this does protect public health and safety. And this quote is theirs, not mine. Only Prime Minister Harper will continue to combat any growth in the use of illegal drugs. We can see other examples from other governments where harm reduction has been second-guessed, you know, where they're not willing to uh, embrace it. Uh, for example, Andrew Scheer, uh, who is the current leader of the Conservative Party of Canada in 2017, said, and this, these are all his quotes, I really do think we need to move beyond this kind of supervised injection where the government makes it, quote-unquote, as he said, safer to inject illicit drugs. Questioner, so you're not in favor of harm reduction. You don't approve of supervised injection sites. Answer by Mr. Scheer, I don't believe that should be the focus. That is the line of demarcation between the Prime Minister and myself. There's nothing there that breaks the cycle of addiction. Now that last line happens to be entirely contrary to the evidence as accepted by the Supreme Court and as public health uh, experts acknowledge that it does help people break the cycle of addiction when they want that, when they're ready for it and with appropriate services.
There are other in, in, examples of indifference or hostility to harm reduction. In Ontario now, the current uh, Premier, Premier Doug Ford, had previously criticized uh, overdose prevention sites. But his own health minister said, well, actually, Mr. Premier, the evidence clearly demonstrated that these sites were necessary. The government, res the government responded by capping the number of sites uh, uh, to uh, uh, 21. But health promotion groups had said, why are we even doing this review in the first place? Uh, because, you know, the news was so good about harm reduction approaches. So in Ontario, existing overdose prevention sites have to reapply. And with this you know, arbitrary cap at 21. And as the Globe said, no one seems quite certain where that number came from uh, because we should have harm reduction sites based upon need, not based upon a simple number drawn from thin air. I want you to think locally about uh, uh, the struggles to implement uh, the Controlled uh, Drugs and Substances Strategy and its harm reduction uh, uh, arm. Um, our own uh, Nova Scotia government has an opioid use and overdose framework, and it talks about the people who use drugs. And it says quite sensibly that they are our young people, our family members, our neighbors, and are most vulnerable, and they live beside us in our communities. They are part of the human family, or they may be part of our family, your family. But interestingly, when I started thinking about uh, public health approaches to problematic drug use in Nova Scotia, I also examined um, th the uh, highway fatality statistics. Since 2014, except 2018, more people have died from opioids than on our highways in Nova Scotia. So these, these are the, the most recent uh, statistics on opioid toxicity deaths. Uh, and you'll note that the numbers hover between approximately 53 and 67 from 2012 to 2017. And as of January 31st, 2019, on the Nova Scotia Opioid Use and Overdose Strategy stats, there have been 49 confirmed, 11 probable uh, opioid toxicity deaths in 2018, three probable opioid toxicity deaths in 2019. We look at the deaths on our highway. We look at traffic fatalities. You see they've gone down, you know, with more investment in vehicle safety and highway construction, you know, so that if you recall my statistics from about 2014 on, with the exception of 2018, more people died as a result of opioid toxicity than on our highways as a result of motor vehicle collisions. What does that tell us? Well, that tells us that we should be concentrating insofar as it's possible on harm reduction uh, uh, methods. So there are local efforts to increase the range of services that you've already heard about when I introduced our, our panelists. Um, the current campaign, for example, to create an overdose prevention site has as a primary goal as an OPS to help prevent and respond to drug overdoses through peer monitoring, through rapid intervention. Uh, they're simpler and they're temporary. They're not to su supervise consumption sites, although they're aligned in terms of values. Uh, locally, an OPS has received encouragement from the chief of police, the mayor, politicians from effective neighborhoods, a coalition of service providers, social scientists, former and present users, lawyers, legal academics, pro bono DAL students, liberalized federal regulations, and public policy think tanks. Um, but, you know, they're a little bit stymied now. I think that it'll still happen, as I hope other health harm reduction methods will as well, because there is still a stigma surrounding drug use. We haven't removed that war mentality. There is some opposition by some, not all, business owners and community members. But this notion uh, that we are, should put the brakes on harm reduction approaches is really uh, a fairly universal problem. Uh, the Civil Society Task Force on Drugs talks about the lack of political will or interest to change punitive approaches due to a variety of reasons. Some people would say, as is noted here by the Civil Society Task Force report, that the status quo is acceptable uh, and that, that a shift towards a public health approach may appear permissive. And you wouldn't want to do that. Because although it is permissive in a way and it's not punitive, it will save lives. That's the side of it that can't be denied. So I said I would extend the argument about uh, um, harm reduction approaches. Um, you can see how through the control of drugs and substance strategy uh, that uh, the government is developing that harm reduction has been embraced uh, in Canada and I hope it will continue to be, notwithstanding whatever may happen in, in political circles nationally. Um, so when we think about harm reduction, we should also be thinking then of its extension to decriminalization of other 
harder drugs. Uh, so, for example, uh, in 2018, drug policy still is, for many nations, an ideological issue rather than a societal topic that can be addressed through evidence and dialogue. But 26 countries have adopted a decriminalization model to facilitate access to health services and reduce stigma and prison overcrowding. Canada can join this course. I hope we will, as our policy uh, through the Canadian Drugs and Substances Strategy uh, evolves. I hope that it will recommend decriminalization. Now, decriminalization, to define it uh, more precisely, in, in, in involves not legalization, which is what we've done with cannabis, but the removal of sanctions under the criminal law uh, and the optional use of possible administrative sanctions, that is still legal controls, but not with the heavy hand of the criminal law, and possible availability of treatment, or in some nations, and I don't say we should embrace this, mandated treatment. There are lots of proponents of decriminalization. The Canadian HIV AIDS legal network talks about the federal government uh, decriminalizing activities related to personal drug use, and it notes that calls are mounting, including among health professionals who have been calling for a public health approach to problematic drug use. The Toronto Medical Officer of Health says, our current approach is not wor working. This is less than a year ago. We should treat drug use as a public health and social issue, not a criminal issue. We should call on the federal government to decriminalize possession of all drugs for personal use, scale up prevention, harm reduction, and treatment services, uh, and explore options for the legal regulation of all drugs in Canada. The Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction says the evidence is going to support various approaches to decriminalizations as effective ways to mitigate the harms of substance use, especially those harms associated with criminal justice prosecution for simple possession. So they say that recognizing substitute, substance use as a health rather than a criminal justice issue is a fundamental starting point for reform. Now, unfortunately, the current Prime Minister in February 2018, notwithstanding his support for the Cannabis Act, notwithstanding the current government's support you know, for the Canada Drugs and Substances Strategy, did say decriminalization of harder drugs is not a step that Canada is looking at uh, taking at this point. So there is that same sort of stopping point at a clarity of vision and the willingness to consider evidence apparently at the stage of decriminalization. I regret that, again, because I think that the logic of it is, uh, uh, is really irresistible. But the current government says we are not going that far. Um, now, their own task force may you know, require them to respond, let's say. I, I would hope and in some ways, I'd be surprised that uh, the task force report doesn't at least think more seriously about decriminalization. Finally, I want to make the point that I mentioned to you. You know, this whole notion that I see as emerging from uh, the reduction of uh, the war mentality with respect to problematic substance use can be used with respect to other criminal justice uh, issues. Uh, public health approaches, broadly speaking, are adaptable to other parts of the justice system. For example, homicide is a local problem that is amenable to harm reduction. Our national homicide statistics say that although homicide rates have been declining over the last uh, a few uh, decades, there was an uptake in 2009, uh, sorry, 2017, the highest since 2009, and we had the highest firearm-related homicide uh, rate in, in uh, 2017. So in Nova Scotia, homicide is, uh, 2017 was at its highest point since 2011. Um, and Canada, uh, in Canada, they maintain statistics of uh, metropolitan census areas. Nova Scotia was the seventh highest of 23 cities in the 100 to 500,000 uh, population range in terms of our uh, homicide rate. So you can see homicide in addition to substances, you can see homicide, the toughest problem in some ways, the criminal justice system faces, especially firearm-related homicide, as a uh, public health problem as well. Gun violence, uh, uh, from, as the Keck School of Medicine says, has long been defined by public safety and politics, but not by public health. And as Nancy Krieger from the Harvard School of Public Health says, we in public health count dead people in order to understand how to prevent preventable deaths. So you can see homicide even, 
you know, at the extreme of criminal violence as a public health problem. Well, you can use the same logic and the same approach of considering what the cause is, what the evidence is, and what you can do to prevent it. So you can use core public health activities to interrupt the, the transmission of violence. You can think about conducting research to gain insight into the causes and assess the impact of interventions. You can identify risk factors and, no kidding, poverty and depression uh, and lack of resilience or other protective factors are relevant to thinking about homicide rates. You can develop, implement, and evaluate interventions to reduce risk factors that eventually lead to homicide and to build resistance on the part of communities. And you can institutionalize successful prevention strategies using that same health-promoting uh, and human rights-promoting lens. So, I'm done with my part. Three minutes longer than I promised. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, to conclude then, the uh, mentality of the war on drugs, while it may be fading, has, has not yet uh, disappeared. The Cannabis Act and the Canadian Drugs and Substances Strategy provides evidence of the capacity of government to move beyond the ideology of prohibition, elimination, and enforcement. Um, and there can be next stages beyond the simple Cannabis Act, as trendy as it has been. We can think about extending that analysis, as I've mentioned. We can think about recognizing the human rights of people who use drugs. Uh, we can think about them as human beings with inalienable and fundamental human rights. Uh, we can accept the necessity of relying on evidence as part of a public health and harm reduction approach. We can think about expanding supports and services of people who use drugs. And we can take that same kind of peacetime mentality further. Uh, and we can think about uh, the decriminalization of substance, uh, be substances beyond the, the current range of legalization, and we can revisit perennial criminal justice problems using the public health uh, lens. Um, we can think about uh, public health prevention, or public health promotion, uh, and uh, violence prevention as interlinked. Uh, and I think that can work. But I want us to move beyond simple cannabis legalization to those other domains, because I think our society would be safer, and I think we'd protect people's human rights better. So thanks so much for giving me the opportunity uh, to provide an extended uh, discussion of what I think is the aftermath of uh, what is probably the biggest public policy failure and criminal justice failure failure of the last hundred years, uh, the disastrous war on drugs, and thinking about what can occur in peacetime when willing, people are willing to consider the evidence uh, in every domain of harmful human activity. So thanks so much. I now look to hear uh, from uh, uh, Cindy and from Jillian uh, and uh, from Doug, uh, and uh, you know, they'll present their own unique insights into some of the areas that I've explored, um, and uh, I know that we'll all be better off hearing that lived experience as well. So thank you. So this is the second time I've uh, had to follow Archie. It's a tough act to follow. Um, so my experience comes from the community and uh, working with people who use substances. And uh, that's really important to use that language. Um, people that used or use uh, substances. Um, we trying to get away from the language of drug addicts, um, junkies, all of that kind of language. Uh, I started this work back in 2001. I joined uh, Mainline Needle Exchange. Uh, Direction 180 opened under the back stairs of the Needle Exchange and is a program of the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center. And the program was designed as a pilot project for 30 people uh, to provide methadone. Um, and it, it came into being based on the needs of the community because they noticed a shift in the demographic of people who were using substances. And at the time, there was uh, a very limited uh, uh, program at uh, addictions and mental health and it was very stringent and so if you came late you'd be discharged if you used another substance you'd be discharged and so people were continuously caught up in this revolving door of starting treatment being discharged 
and uh, not connect it. So there were physicians and stakeholders and people with lived experience that did a lot of research and a model uh, started in 2001 uh, under the stairs of the needle exchange. And within the first six months, we had over 80 people. And in addition to uh, their substance use with opiates, there were, there were other drugs that they were using. Um, they had other issues. There were housing issues. There was hep C, HIV, um, you know, uh, you know, malnutrition, um, lacked connection, lacked uh, family support, in involvement with the criminal justice system. So there was a lot. And so, you know, we were a skeleton program. We just said, okay, let's just do what we can do, you know, as people come through the door. And sometimes it's about a pair of socks um, that somebody needs because they've been running the streets um, for hours and their feet need a pair of dry boots and a pair of socks and sometimes it's about an abscess wound that they've got because they haven't had a safe place to inject. Um, sometimes it's about you know their relationship with their partner and the drug use and and the violence and sometimes it's about a bad trick on the street and sometimes it's about um, grieving the loss of their children and sometimes it's about um, losing a friend you know so all of those things people come through the door with those things and um, sometimes they come in cranky and they curse and swear at you and that's okay you know when I when I got up this morning I had I had a hot cup of coffee I had a bed and, uh, you know, I came to work and life was okay. I didn't come from the shelter down the street where, you know, 50 people were sleeping beside me, snoring or with smelly feet, right? Um, so, you know, for me, it's about the, the you know, taking into to perspective all of those situations where people end up because of the poor policies, right? You know, the abscess wound doesn't get treated because if you go to Emerge, they're going to label you as drug seeking. And so you already know you use drugs. You don't need somebody to, you know, crack you on the knuckles for that, right? Um, we don't do that to diabetics, you know, a diabetic that uh, eats, uh, you know, cream puffs will probably be Vandal donuts now. Um, you know, we don't take away their insulin. You know, so our program was built around those pieces, those important pieces of making that human connection and understanding that, yes, sometimes drug use continues, but you're going to have your methadone. You're going to have an appropriate dose. It's not about an arbitrary ceiling. You know, a lot of programs say uh, maximum dose is 120. You know, you might be drug seeking. You need more. It's about an optimal dose where the person is comfortable. People in our program are heroes, right? Um, how many of you have ever been on a medication of some sort? Have you ever forgotten to take it? Yeah, antibiotics, you don't take the whole thing. Well, people in our program travel every day. They got to get out of bed, wherever that is, and travel 365 days of the year to get their treatment. And so there's a lot of myths and stigma about opiate treatment. And I don't call it substitution therapy because that's labeling. I call it opiate assisted treatment. And they get up out of bed and uh, they've got to get on a bus, sometimes two buses, rain, wind, or shine, and uh, come to get their medication so that they're better. You know, they're already committed um, to, you know, uh, a path of recovery. And, um, you know, we, we've got to get away from these boxes where you know, uh, we expect people to fit into these boxes and, and, and achieve certain outcomes, right? You know, the bottom line, uh, a dead addict cannot kick clean, right? Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's about being there at whatever place they're in. And, you know, I just um, I think about these policies and I think about where we've come, Direction 180, since the inception, right? 
um, and the and the, the barriers we've encountered. Um, and it's funny because you know you look at a community like Fairview, and and there's a lot a, a lot of crime, and a lot of substance use. We know that, right? Uh, one of the toughest areas that the, the HRP you know speak of, and um, <clears throat> When we went to put an opiate treatment program there, uh, we got backlash, and the community raised five hundred thousand dollars in less than a week, four hundred to buy the host back, and gave us one hundred thousand to get our bus. You know the problem, or problem, or the issue was already in that community. But the minute you want to put a solution there, all of a sudden everybody's panicking. It's the same thing we're experiencing with the OPS, right? There's, you know, injection drug use in the bathrooms of the businesses. People are locking their doors. Outreach is picking up, you know, um, any anywhere from, I, I don't know, it's been about 60,000 needles in the last year through foot patrols. And it's there, but people don't want the solution. Oh, my God, we can't have an overdose prevention site in our community. So... You know, that's so challenging. And then, you know, the whole piece with involvement with the criminal justice system and, and um, you know, how people are forced to suffer, their human rights continuously are violated because they're not given their medications. They're denied their medications. They suffer and withdraw. And, um, you know, it, those are the things that make my blood boil. Those are the things when I hear people say, those people. You know, those people, they're, they're people. We're just all people, right? And we're all subject to, you know, experiencing some kind of, you know, way of uh, dealing with life on life's terms, right? And and sometimes it becomes problematic. And, you know, so we've got to, you know, figure out a way to be compassionate and be there for people. And, um, you know... Uh, in the in, in the last you know eighteen plus years of, of, of doing this work in the community, you know I've come ag come up against so so much uh, systemic stigma and discrimination, you know, towards people, and um, you know I continue to try and fight, um, but we've had progress too. You know, um, back in two thousand one, if you you were on methadone and you were with Direction 180, you wouldn't get it inside, but somebody from uh, the Dartmouth program would. It was systemic uh, stigma. And so, you know, um, there has been some change, but we have so much work to do. I encourage you all to look at uh, Health Canada's website um, on, on stigma, and they have some great videos there to look at. And the language, you know, the language is so important, how we talk about this, right? And we need to talk about it. You know, it's not a dirty secret. It's a shame when we lose someone to an overdose and their parents are ashamed to identify what it was, right? Um, we need to talk about it. And we need safe supply. You know, Archie, oh, Archie, yeah, three minutes left. Archie, uh, you know, spoke about decriminalization. Well, we need controlled, regulated substances. We need to be giving people a safe supply. We need to undercut um, the dealers with this contaminated fentanyl. And we need to provide people with safe substances. Anyone here drink alcohol? When you go to the pub, you can order a beer, a glass of whatever it is. You go to the liquor store. You are assured that what you're consuming is a safe product. What a luxury that is. If you're a person who chooses to use substances, you don't have that assurity. You know, and you and you're forced to, to engage in illegal activities to get it and uh, subject to so many other harms. So yeah. That's my uh, I guess my little rant, my soapbox for tonight. Um, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks so much, uh, Cindy. Jillian, we look forward to hearing from you. Um, we just starting with what Cindy said about um, getting rid of the stigma. You know, someone with lived experience, um, yes, I do work in harm reduction now, and I do give a lot back to the community, but most importantly is my lived experience. 
Um, that is how I'm able to understand where these people are coming from. These people are me. I am these people. And uh, I was there needing a pair of socks and, and needing, you know, a safe supply at one time. So to see how important uh, that is, is, is just phenomenal, um, especially when I see the need on the other side. It, it really is interesting to, to be on the other side of the coin. Um, I guess Archie is saying how it's just say no. Um, well, when you look at it as a disease concept, concept you can't just say no. Um, you know, you just don't just wake up and want to have a cold one day. You don't wake up and want to be sick each day. So, um, to be committed to recovery is is in itself. It, it's difficult. It's it's very difficult. Um, and that's where I think we have to look at people as human and see that they do struggle and um, basically just giving them that hand along the way is the only way to ensure that they are going to be successful. Um, you know, if, if you fail, try and try again, you know, and that's kind of my whole life story, really. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know what else to say as long as... Um, it just needs to be recognized so that it's not pushed into the underworld where it does put people in in dangerous places and where we are losing friends and loved ones and um, you know I was that person that was in many dangerous situations and not knowing where to turn for help um, not long ago I was even promoting um, this Good Samaritan law you know and asking the HRP they don't even know what that entails so you know we're telling people that you know you should be a good Samaritan and call in overdoses if you see them and you won't be discriminated against and you won't be you know held to this level of the law well the police don't even know what that entails so I mean for us to be promoting these things I think we need to know what we're telling people and what we're pushing them into um, and I just think it's important to have you know a, everybody's side of the coin I mean obviously you know we all have to live together but um, there's probably not somebody in this room that doesn't know another addict or lived with another addict or loved somebody with an addiction of some kind so um, with that in mind just yeah nice people use drugs and be kind <laughs> that's about it Go. Hi guys, um, I really don't know where to start, um, bear with me, I had a bit of a toothache tonight, I had to break down and go to the uh, dentist last night, and um, that was a bit of a trip, but i um, doing okay, I'm here right now, um, I'm doing some work with, uh, with Hand Up, but uh, first I have to tell a little bit about myself, 37 years old, I've uh, been in the, the, the judicial system and group homes and jails and stuff since I was about 12. So uh, I'm really pretty familiar with all the, the opposite sides of the track. But um, I've been sober now for about three years. I've been uh, out of custody uh, about five years. So I've been in, doing doing a lot to keep my life on, on the right side of the tracks lately. It's, it's a lot of running into a lot of problems and stuff. Um, I'm originally from Newfoundland too, so I probably hear my accent sometimes. It overrides here, <laughs> gets me in a couple situations here too. But um, yeah, we need to get get more out there about the uh, harm reduction and stuff because uh, people think that this isn't affecting them, and it's it's really affecting us all. Everybody's part of this part of this problem. You know, since I've been in, in Halifax, I've been here about two and a half years, three years now, and. Since I've been here, I've witnessed about five, six, seven, I think seven overdoses. People that I've, of friends that became friends with me. And that's a short amount of time. That's a lot of people died in, in this community alone. And, um, you know, I really don't really have a, have a whole lot put together to say right now. I deal with really bad anxiety and stuff, too. Um, so uh, if I get a little overwhelmed sometimes, just bear with me. But um, another thing I wanted to mention was I, last night when I was at the dental office, um, I should have went there a week ago, but I've been putting it off and putting it off, you know, a big wimp. But uh, anyway, I, I ended up going there, and when I when I left, they gave me a prescription, for some painkillers, and so I went to the pharmacy right next to the to the office and to the dental office, and I went in and seen a pharmacy. 
pharmacist and I said, um, it's possible that I can get the prescription filled. And she said, yeah, just hold on a minute, no sweat. She took the prescription. She said, come back in another 20 minutes. <laughs> Gave her my health coverage and whatnot. And then I uh, went back 20 minutes later and she said, oh, sorry, we're not going to be able to fill your prescription because um, you're, you're only entitled to one pharmacy because of notes on your files. So I was like, okay. Anyway, thank you. I went on. And uh, come to think of it, what it is, it's because I'm labeled as a drug seeker now. From I've been sober for like almost four years now. And still, aftermath, like running into things like that. You know, it's it's very disheartening and stuff. So um, there needs to be a lot, a lot of these little barriers broke down. Like even so much as that. Like I didn't even want to. Like I probably don't even want to go back to the dentist. I don't even. Want, I don't even want to deal with anything, anybody now for a little bit over that. But I guess I'm gonna have to. Um, put, put my big boy pants on and go back, I guess. But, uh, but um, yeah, um, really don't have a whole lot more to say. But uh, with the OPS, the overdose prevention site, I think it's uh, very important that we have that here in the community. Um, there's a lot of people fighting for it, and I'm sure there's people fighting against it. But, um, you know, these there's people dying in, in the streets, you know, what I mean, in, in the corners and in the curbs and the alleyways and stuff like that, man. It's... It's, uh, it's, it's as real as it's going to get, and, uh, you know, I just don't want to see any more bodies myself, and I don't want to lose any more friends, and, uh, yeah, so, thanks for hearing, thanks for having me. Well, thank you most sincerely to uh, Cindy, Jillian, and Doug, um, and no, to my students, the next class won't be as good, uh, but uh, uh, you can see what they add you know, to what can otherwise be quite an abstract discussion, even when we consider that this is a fundamental human rights issue. So I thank you warmly for coming to the law school. So now we have the time to uh, ask questions. I've uh, tried to assist uh, audiences in many different uh, settings with the question asking part. So please feel free to ask a question. Put it to me. I will repeat it so that it can be uh, recorded. You can direct it to me, any panel member, or all of us as the case may be. The only thing I would ask if you're going to ask questions is to do it succinctly. Um, and don't make a speech. Just ask the question and we'll try to respond. So... Do you have any questions? Yes. Um, what would you say would be the ideal uh, uh, harm reduction framework? Like the ideal state of it? For the benefit of the recording, the question is, what would be the ideal harm reduction framework? Well, personally, I would have thought you should embrace everything in the uh, retinue of, of harm reduction options that I mentioned uh, earlier, that they all have their place and different people have uh, different needs. So we're already following, in some ways, harm reduction options. We started with uh, um, you know, the uh, availability uh, of uh, medication for people. You know, we have uh, you know, uh, programs to provide needles with uh, social supports and so on. I'd like to see everything done because I think that would reduce deaths and promote public health. But I look to members of the panel to, to, for each of you to say, you know, what would be the ideal harm reduction framework? Yeah, um, yeah so for, for me, I, I think of a, a dear friend, uh, an advocate, Rafi Ballin from Ontario, who passed away uh, from an overdose uh, a couple of years ago, and he believed that um, harm reduction was just the result of poor drug policy and that it should be, uh, we shouldn't even you know, be talking about harm reduction, we should be just having equitable access to all mm -hmm. health services, whatever that looks like for everybody. And um, you know, that's, that, that would be my, my uh, dream, that we had you know, equitable access to all services for people who use substances across the country. And I think peer-run programs are important as well because they add hope to the community and, and they make people part of the process. <laughs> <laughs> what she said. Pretty much what they said. Yeah. You want to add anything, Doug? Um, 
just uh, myself, just uh, the OPS site right now is, is a dream for me, but because I've seen, like I said, I've been here a short amount of time and seen quite a, million, quite a lot of people die, so I'd really like to see them get get up, that up and running because it'd probably help. So, yeah, that's it. Thanks so much. Any other questions? Yes? <coughs> So the question is for the recording um, to Jillian, you know, discuss your role and how you participate in those various programs. Mm -hmm. um, well, I work with the needle uh, exchange program, so obviously I do a lot of reach work. Um, I go out on site, um, collecting dirties, um, giving out clean supplies to people in need of them. Um, not waiting for people to come in and get the supplies. Um, we actually go right out in the community to, you know, hot spots. You, I guess you guys would call them some pretty shady neighborhoods. And, you know, we offer the services that they probably wouldn't go get unless you were right there at the time, you know. Sometimes I got to wait for somebody to do a hit before they come outside to actually get their supplies, you know, which they probably, like I say, would not access. Um, Hand up is um, people from every different level of recovery, from people that are currently using to people who are in recovery, um, and it's uh, many different um, ways of advocating the community, such as the OPS, um, just doing engagements like this, and just offering them hope in their addiction and showing <coughs> them that there is a better way. Yeah. And I guess PALS is obviously offering people um, hope because I mean getting into jail these people have nothing you know mm -hmm. and, and it's just it's just being practical I mean to expect people to get out with nothing and build off of that is just you know <coughs> it's, it's not um, you know, it's just raising our expectations for people and giving them a chance to start over I guess. Thank you. And, and Jillian you, you also mentioned your involvement with uh, Stepping Stone, at, yeah. at, at which yeah. assists. I'm a member of Stepping Stone. I don't work with Stepping Stone, um, but I find it. I think it's very important. Um, it works with sex workers in the community, um, especially for a woman as a drug addict in the community. It leads you into situations you probably wouldn't be in otherwise, um, and it helps reduce violence to women um, and putting them in high risk situations and sexual situations. So, yeah. Thanks, Julia. Any other questions? Yes, uh, I don't know to whom. Yeah. Okay, on the left. Go ahead, that's you. Okay. Uh, just a question of Julian and uh, what made you stop or say, I'm going to get out of this? The question is then uh, for Julian and Doug, you know, what made you decide to uh, stop, get out of it? I was tired. There's no other reason. I was just tired. There wasn't too many, you know, they say jails, institutions, and death, and all I had left was death. So, and I'd been pretty close to that a couple times, so, yeah, that's just about it. And I didn't have much to go on. Um, I didn't, you know, I'd lost everybody, everything, and I'm still slowly getting that back. So, yeah, it was, it was just tired. <laughs> the human spirit, I guess, the human condition. <laughs> what about you? Well, for me, I think it was... A uh, quote from Carl, Carl Jung, um, the fear of not changing had to become greater than the fear of changing. Mm. So once that finally happened, then I guess I, I kind of, yeah, staying the same was just too scary. I knew the outcome of it. It was either going to be the grave or, well, that's, that's what it would have been. So It's insanity. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there was a question to his left. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, you mentioned something about uh, folks coming to you in this program uh, who may have lost their children. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of the child welfare system itself. Mm -hmm. And um, if you could, um, I'm just trying to think, would you in fact possibly work with someone in the child welfare system? and work with their so-called social worker or whoever it is, and how receptive is that system towards working with you? Okay, the question is then, uh, for people who are involved with child protection issues, uh, how can one support them uh, in order to try to preserve their custodial relationship? What can be done to assist people? So, uh, we do, we do work with CPS. Uh, However, it's, um, 
you know, there are not a lot of external supports for women. You're not allowed to what? Uh, there are not a lot of external supports for women. So, you know, if you're on opiate treatment and you go to the IWK, uh, right away, workers are uh, involved. And, you know, we don't have, you know, it's, it's sort of that three strike mentality where right. you have so much time to get your, uh, your act together yeah. and then you lose, right? And so we need to be more creative and innovative about providing, you know, other supports mm -hmm. because we know we're only perpetuating the problem when children are taken away from their biological mother. And so we have to do a better job. Um, if this was a urine, in, in this cup it's not, but I mean, if this was a urine, that's, you know, primarily what we use to determine whether or not somebody is a good parent. And that's not a good practice, right? And I think, you know, we need to be more creative and, you know, finding other ways. We pay more to foster parents to look after children than we do parents to raise their children. So there's a lot of systemic barriers. And, um, you know, you have, it's a system. You have good workers and you have workers that, you know, uh, are, 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 are not as flexible or, or understanding, so. Question, yes, uh, back right there. In the child welfare, uh, where do you see the potential for other uh, research into better and more effective treatment? And also, you mentioned other uh, opposition from our community when you bring demonstrated effective treatment, and what are the reasons behind this? So the question is, uh, what do you see by way of opposition and potential for uh, more effective treatment? So for, for child welfare, I see, you know, facilities where um, moms ha have access to their children for a longer period of time that is supportive and links to trauma-informed care and other, you know, other supports. Um, you know, I think that that would be helpful. Um, it's just so cut and dry. and. Um, I, I, I know, you know, ha having worked and witnessed, you know, some, some of our women who've lost like four or five children, you know, over the years, you know, maybe this time I'll, I'll get it right, maybe this time <coughs> it'll be okay, and the fear and hiding pregnancies and the risks that that imposes, it's, you know, the imbalance, the imbalance for women who use substances that are, you know, pregnant, it's just so, so why? And even in the screening, you know, if I were to use substances when I was pregnant and I went for a screening, they would ask me, do you use cocaine? Do you use uh, uh, opiates? Do you use uh, benzodiazepine? Do you use? They would ask me questions about all of those drugs. Already I'm not feeling comfortable in saying that I use those drugs. What we should be doing is saying, you know, have, are you aware that if you do use cocaine that we have this available? Are you aware that you're, if you're opiate dependent we have this available? Changing the power dynamic in the conversation so that people feel more comfortable um, to, to disclose and come forward. More sugar, get more with sugar and with salt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course you have to respect the safety and care of children, I'm not denying that. but. The questions, I think I saw your hand before. Yeah, I'm just wondering if any, I don't ever hear any strategies leveled about taking the government or government institutions or police forces to court to sue them for these human rights violations that I've heard mentioned on a number of occasions. And it seems to me that over time, there's been this sustained marketing campaign paid for by the government for the last hundred years to support a war on drugs so isn't it time that we kind of turned it on its head and started suing the people who are? Uh, because I don't think I don't think that the they're going to come quietly, especially when you see the comments from a guy like Sheer and 
Yeah. Well, I, I can respond uh, not too expansively. Um, I think the insight case from the Supreme Court of Canada is a good example of uh, where the legal system has provided a backstop for the protection of human rights um, and harm reduction uh, measures. That's relatively rare. Um, the uh, war on drugs has been waged quite relentlessly. The courts have bought into it, uh, and it has resulted in harms to our legal system at a number of levels. It's alienated vulnerable members of the public uh, from uh, our legal system. It's permitted uh, uh, discriminatory and abusive police practices. Um, it has unfortunately resulted uh, in the adoption by the courts of uh, the notions of the war on drugs as being essential you know, to, to be uh, uh, pursued uh, relentlessly. So our courts have uh, distorted you know, fundamental principles of, of law and our constitution as part of the war on drugs. So I don't mean to be pessimistic, and as a lawyer I hate to be uh, someone who um, you know, doesn't hold out some promise for the law uh, in the general area of this uh, broad uh, field of public policy. But uh, unfortunately, the legal system has been used in the other direction. It's, it's been used to penalize. It's been used to uh, imprison. Um, and uh, uh, it's been because the government has the right to make these policies. Uh, and it's only in extraordinary instances, such as insight, where there's a cause of action that's challenging challengeable under the Constitution or otherwise. So the suing option is attractive for me, I can assure you. Uh, but that said, uh, um, what you really need is enlightened public policy uh, where uh, our political leaders go further than the ones uh, I gave you examples of tonight. Uh, and where it would be nice to think uh, that it was a nonpartisan issue uh, and uh, uh, where uh, the governments at all levels would say, well, we want to stop this war, we want to protect people, we want to save lives, we want to uh, ensure their human rights are, are protected. I wish the legal system were configured differently and politicians really were prepared to exercise the leadership. But we can see we're bumping up against those limits. I gave you the example of the reaction to insight. I gave you the example of the current prime minister saying we're not going to look at decriminalization. I gave you the uh, example of uh, uh, Mr. Scheer saying that you know he uh, is opposed to some current harm reduction uh, measures, and uh, Prime Minister uh, Trudeau saying that we're not going to consider decriminalization. So I, I would like to ride on this wagon, but I'm afraid that that's not the place. We need to think about law reform. Uh, we need to think about influencing uh, politicians as citizens, you know, so that the rights of, of people won't be abused any longer. So that's my not too expansive answer. But I don't know about the rest of you. you know, do, do you have any kind of feeling about the usefulness of the legal system, you know, to kind of combat the harms of the war on drugs? You've been a victim of it, I think. Yeah, and I think people are so beat down at this point, and when they get to the point that their liberties are being violated, they're already so beat down and they are so taken of their self-confidence that, you know, for them to, to fight back at that point, it's almost, you know, useless, and, and it's, it's, they just don't have the energy left in them. So, you know, maybe if we were to make a change before, then people would be able to, to do so, but it's getting to the point where they're just so beat down by the time it gets to that point that there's, you know, people are just going along with it. Doug, anything to add? You, you've been a victim of the war on drugs. I have no comment. The police aren't watching, Doug. No, I, I, know, I know. No, I don't know. I don't, which really don't know what to say about it right now. Okay. Fear. There's a lot of fear. A lot of fear. Fair enough. Yes? In follow up to that, so we've heard a lot about peer support and informal support between the services that are being Of 
recognizing the support of people, and yet that allows some application of responsibility. Okay, I, I, I understand the question to be uh, related to the importance of peer support and the recognition of its value, but the inherent undesirability of letting government just say we're going to abandon conventional medical and social supports and give it all over to social support. So how do you balance that out? That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think results speak for itself. <coughs> undeniable you know the results that it's not it's not all pure work that's being done that's just a, something new that's you know as I've seen in recent years that's been just been delivering results I think it's a collaboration of everything again I, I really don't have anything to say because without if I had the answer to that one I think I'd if I had I don't I really don't have an answer for that <laughs> you know I wish I did have you all have you yeah. benefited from peer support? Oh, oh definitely. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. De definitely benefited from peer support for sure. Every day, you know, it's uh, the groundwork. You get up every day and then go be involved with, with, with this. You know, you should see the people. And you're you know? right. There's so many things that people are doing that the government should be doing. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. I understand that part too. Yeah, and it is because a lot of times you think, well, well, they're going to take care of it anyway. They got it already, so we don't have to deal with it. We don't really have it. We're just all holding it together by the strings now, you know what I mean? And, and there's people dying. So it's like, it's, they brush it out to us, but there's people dying while we're trying to hold it together, it seems. And, you know, people that have read about it in a book or people that have lived it, you know, yeah. there's really no comparison when it comes to experience wise. I think. So we need both peer support Most plus definitely. conventional Most medical definitely. and social supports. Okay. Any other questions, please? Yes. <laughs> Well, to me, you know, the question is, you know, how do we position the importance of human rights uh, and how do we, you know, make that the guiding principle, if, I, I think, if I'm not over-translating. Um, you know, well, I think it's, it's vital for people to understand that when we talk about harm reduction, when we talk about the kind of supports that we've been mentioning for people who use drugs, to understand that it's a human right, it's not just compassionate, it's not just a good thing to do, but that because people are entitled to the highest uh, uh, attainable standard of health and well-being, uh, that it, it's a right that everybody has, not just me, an old, you know, white middle class guy, you know, but people, you know, who come from different strata of society, and particularly as we're talking about tonight, people who use drugs where it may be problematic, that they too are entitled, you know, to uh, the protections that we all should have. Um, and and I, so I think you, you do, you know, hit it on the head, and I wish government were more guided by that, you know, the, the, the notion that it is a fundamental human right that we're talking about that belongs to everyone in the human community. One thing I do regret, notwithstanding my extolling the virtues of the evolving Canada drugs and, and substance strategy, is that they don't foreground human rights advancement and protection uh, as uh, prominently as they should, a, a view that I've expressed to them. Uh, but, uh, you know, that is a missing piece. All the other pieces look good, you know, the treatment, and evidence-based and harm reduction and so on, but I think bringing it back to the rights foundation is something that may make governments be a little bit more, um, you know, vigilant uh, and energetic. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, my question is kind of twofold, and it may be directed more towards safety. Um, I'm wondering with regards to medical marijuana, because I'm So the question is, uh, rehab centers uh, versus opiate, you know, substitutes? Yes, yes. Yeah, OPS. Oh, oh, oh yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't quite get it. The overdose prevention. Uh, so that, what would be the benefits of each then? Yeah. yeah. So um, with an overdose prevention site, that's a place, a sterile, safe, supportive environment uh, for somebody who is currently using uh, substances, actively using, and maybe has not expressed a desire to stop or you know hasn't or may never stop and so you provide them with sterile equipment and support and uh, you know allow them to consume their substances 
in a supportive environment to make sure that they don't overdose. Um, the provision of the supplies um, prevents them from contracting hepatitis C or HIV or other uh, uh, infections. Um, and, you know, maybe at some point they may say, hey, I'd like to consider treatment. And so you're there and you can provide that link for them and help them with, you know, other, other issues that they identify as a priority. It's self-directed and it's supportive. Whereas rehabilitation, um, most often is, is uh, surrendering your agency over yourself, usually. Um, you know, it's odd. I could have cancer and I could go in for chemo and I could go outside and have a cigarette and the doctor would probably frown on that and tell me, Cindy, that's not a good thing to do, but he wouldn't stop my treatment. When you go into a rehabilitation, a detox, long-term treatment, if you smoke cigarettes, um, you are discharged. Um, if you want to have your cell, you know, um, what a novel idea, um, they, they will uh, discharge you for, for, you know, hiding your telephone or those kinds of things. So rehabilitation quite often <coughs> you lose agency over yourself and you have to surrender to this idea that I'm going to be abstinent, I'm going to refrain from everything. And so that's, that's hard, you know, to, to make that, um, that switch. Some people can do it. Um, but it makes it harder going back into the real world, still yes. keeping that type of lifestyle. Yeah, some people can, um, but most can't. And it, you know, repeat, you know, visits. And you know, how do you feel about um, an effort to do something when you fail? You know, when you don't have success, you don't you beat yourself up, and so then it's, you know, uh, you're then again at, at risk of a fatal overdose because your tolerance has changed. Once again, it didn't work for me. You know, so there, it's not ideal for everyone. The idea of a low barrier or no barrier approach takes people as they are and understands that you're just a human who needs something at the time. So if we go back to the human rights promoting the approach, just take people the way they are and ask what they need to try to support them. And that may be an OPS for people who continue to use an overdose prevention site where they can use safely, or it may be rehabilitation when they're willing and able you know, to, as, as Cindy says, surrender their agency in order to take on uh, rehabilitation. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, all of you, really, for picking up this issue, and uh, especially to, you know, for myself, thank you to Professor Archie. Um, you know, it's uplifting to see uh, lawmakers getting involved with this. Otherwise, I would, you know, it's such a depressing issue, this issue. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, of course, it's, uh, it's a, a big problem for Canadian people, but it's also wanted to bring it up that it's international. Yes, issue. yes. Uh, just uh, last year alone uh, in Mexico, uh, 100,000 people died. Mm -hmm. because of the uh, uh, violence uh, uh, related to drugs. I, I think that as a society that somehow we import these drugs, somehow they make it here, we, we should feel responsible for some parts of these deaths. This is just Mexico, I'm yes. not talking about the, the rest of the uh, South America. Uh, no, so, so you know. But however, the sense that I'm getting from your talk is that it actually doesn't look very rosy the future well. uh, of this problem. And so I have uh, two questions. One is like, um, so, so I'm getting that talking to politicians is the main imposing on politicians some changes is the main kind of 
Well, the, the question is, how do you influence the process of change? Uh, and I think the answer has to be that as a community, uh, we citizens you know, have to try to influence government to evolve beyond prohibition uh, because that imposes the burden of criminality on the whole population. Um, and so, yes, something has to change at that level of government leadership, and it comes from people like us. Any other questions? And then the second part of my question Sorry. is, is there any hope for further kind of, because, you know, uh, we have, it looks like we have this tendency that we put all the drugs in a one yes. sort of basket, and as many of us know, there's many different types yes. of drugs, and some of them actually can be used to help uh, yes. certain addictions. So, like, for example, magic mushrooms, that they are giving Nova Scotia and some probably yes. are illegal. Yes. Is there some hope that, you know, that maybe some of this uh, kind of like MSD, uh, magic mushrooms, MDMA, the drugs yes. actually can be used? Yes. Yes, I, 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 the question is, what about alternative uses of now illegal drugs uh, for therapeutic purposes? Uh, and I think the answer is research is increasingly being done. It was sort of faddish in the late 60s. It's coming back now. And there is a recognition among some researchers that there are appropriate uses that are beneficial of some banned substances that can help people. And I heard you say yes uh, as well. There, there is a, a task uh, group that is looking at safe supply uh, of MDMA, cocaine, and uh, opiates. So looking at uh, you know the importation of more uh, pharmacy grade heroin and pilot projects. So we're working. It's a national group that is going to make recommendations for uh, the federal government. I, I know that uh, we are approaching that time when, sadly, from my perspective, because you've been a great class, um, uh, I think that we have to wind up. Uh, so I'm being given that signal. Uh, so uh, I want to thank all of you again for coming tonight and participating so earnestly. Uh, and I particularly want to thank our panelists, uh, Cindy, Jillian, and Doug, you know, for making this real for all of us. So.